On today's World Insights, China's Global Security Initiative, a framework in building world peace. How could the initiative work? What will it take for nations to get behind the idea of indivisible security for all? And here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. A year into the Russian-Ukraine crisis, the largest military conflict in Europe since World War II, profound changes have redrawn the international community security landscape. Hostilities have undermined the foundation for international cooperation. The international community needs more rational thinking and practical measures to fix the crisis rather than sending more powerful weapons to the battlefield. For its part, China has issued the Global Security Initiative concept paper. It spells out the core ideas and principles of world security under the initiative. It identifies the priorities and mechanism of cooperation. On the heels of GSI, the Global Security Initiative, China also released a paper on China's position on the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis. It underscores China's policy of promoting peace talks and contributing its ideas for a political settlement rather than a full escalation of the Russian-Ukraine conflict. So what will it take to get the ball rolling toward a truth? And what's the chances of China's proposal, including the Global Security Initiative, help in settling the conflict? For answers, let's have our panelists to discuss. Joining us in Paris, Professor Joab Toker of the American Graduate School in Paris. In Washington, D.C., Surab Gupta, a senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist at the Institute for China-American Studies. In Beijing, Senior Colonel Zhou Bo, a senior fellow of the Center for International Security and Strategy at Tsinghua University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. One year anniversary of the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Everybody has their own version of takeaways. Now, I do want to ask all of you as to how far away from a political settlement or the end game of the conflict. Senior Colonel Joe Bo, you were at the Munich Security Conference. You were discussing with both sides. Tell me more about your thoughts. Of course, Russia was not necessarily that well represented this time, but tell me more about your thoughts. I don't think anybody knows the answer when the war might end. Of course, every war will come and end. But right now, there is no uh, such prospect of any solution anywhere. I was at, at the Munich Security Conference, as you have said, and the atmosphere is Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. Support, support, support to Ukraine. Uh, while there are applauses uh, uh, like waves, one after another, when uh, for example, President Lezinski talking about how the whole world should support Ukraine, or when uh, Prime Minister Sunak talking about how uh, Britain has actually provided mm. uh, uh, support uh, to Ukraine, and the next step will be training of uh, pilots. So with uh, all the West going on and out, with uh, no peace proposal whatsoever from any countries being discussed, I think at least this year, the war will simply continue. Mm. Are we that far away from some kinds of peace talks or peace discussions, even among other parties not directly involved in the conflict? Professor Toker. Well, um, we are far away. I mean, looking at the scene and uh, trying to imagine and to learn from history and get all kind of other insights, the answer to your initial question is yes, we are far away from uh, getting better on this. I mean, in the sense of um, pacifying the, 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 the crisis and ending the war. This is not mm. what you see when you look at different parts of the world and the, the battlefield. Now, uh, when you look at the um, a year past, 
uh, we have at least four countries on Earth which were trying to do something uh, slightly more meaningful, let's say, in the domain of uh, mediation. The French tried, right before the, the, the war started, the Russian invasion started, uh -huh. President Macron didn't go too far. Um, the Israelis started a little bit in a very modest way, didn't get anywhere. The Turks did indeed do some uh, more advanced work and indeed scored some significant uh, uh, um, advantages, especially uh, when it came to the enable the trade yeah. and the traffic of food supplies. Now, China comes in right now. I think that's very good news because it's by far the most powerful and potentially influential uh, a world power, which, although the plan is very general, although we don't see practical, concrete proposals which say it, what the Chinese would have liked to see the Russians do, the Ukrainians do, and others, this is the first time we have a major world player with capacity to influence, okay. with potential leverages, on, especially on the Russian side, but also on the Ukrainian side, entering the scene, and that's very good. Since you talk about this uh, specific proposal, it's only appropriate for me to bring up uh, some excerpts of it before we go to another guest about his takeaways. Let's take a look at this. China stressed the need to abandon the Cold War mentality, according to the latest position paper, the security of a region should not be achieved by strengthening or expanding military blocks, the document stated, adding that there is no simple solution to a complex issue, quote, and that all parties should oppose the pursuit of one's own security at the cost of others' security. Now, Senior Colonel Joe Bull, before I go to our American guests, I do want to ask for your uh, interpretations because we know a lot of the Chinese uh, documents and uh, policy papers are all having uh, their traces in earlier documents, in earlier discussions going on within the country, even sometimes decades ago, about what peace is about as a developing country. Uh, and you also see Senior Colonel Joe Bo, even with the latest uh, UN security uh, 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 discussion going on, uh, we do see a huge number of uh, developing and emerging economies having different uh, positions uh, compared to quote unquote the West. So uh, tell me more about exactly what the Chinese are trying to say in some kinds of abstract language in a way. Uh, to the others, uh, to achieve and to interpret the specific uh, proposals. I think you have uh, mentioned a very important word, abstract, uh, right? Uh, because in China's, uh, you know, uh, position statement paper, you would see all those uh, ideas that are absolutely correct, but they are also most of them are actually. Uh, were actually talked about in the past, except about this kind of a, a indivisible, you know, security concept, which only came up to the war in in Ukraine. The only thing is how how could you carry these principles into action, mm. and more importantly, how can you let others accept these actions? Right now, there are you know proposals flying around, and nobody would really care about them. But don't do not underestimate China's proposal. As a guest from uh, uh, from uh, France has just mentioned, China's uh, uh, influence is huge. Mm -hmm. Therefore, China may, in the future, develop uh, a step-by-step -step roadmap. I'll give you an example, Belt and Road Initiative. When Belt and Road Initiative was mentioned in uh, 2013, few people really think too much about it. But in 10 years' time, what is this, <laughs> this uh, Belt and Road Initiative? It is, a, it is a known throughout the world, right? And it has hugely changed the international economic landscape, if not political landscape. Mm. So things will be done in a, in a gradual, incremental way, and probably this is a Chinese approach. Mm. Of course, this is a, a certainly a, a, a very interesting source of information for Mr. Gupta, who has been doing research on China-U.S. relations, but I know you want to come in with your thoughts on the Russian-Ukraine conflict and so certainly the Chinese policy paper. Yes, uh, you know, on your initial question with regard to when we might see a peace plan or a peace proposal, 
I would say we would be in a much better position to know about this at the end of summer, end of end of this year's summer. And I don't think it's about peace proposal. It's more about a, about a ceasefire, about mm. having a ceasefire agreement. You know, Ukraine is being given this this summer to launch its offensive to recapture as much territory as it can with the best Western uh, arms and ammunition. Uh, it has an inherent right of self-defense, but it is arrayed against what is probably a, the world champion in attritional land warfare. So we'll just have to see if the front lines move mm. and whether the front lines move. And depending on success or failure of what the Ukrainians are capable, I think we might be in a position by late summer to see the beginnings of trying to have some sort of a ceasefire agreement. Mm. And that can be thereafter a stepping stone to trying to find some sort of a larger peace arrangement, I would, I right. would think. Right. The reason we are having a lot of the images on the battlefield is because we have very little images about trying to achieve peace related to Russian-Ukraine crisis, by the way. I talked to my producers about this before the show, and we could hardly find much video that we could use here that would suggest the political settlement right here. Having said that, though, Mr. Gupta, what about the latest uh, political uh, settlement uh, advice or policy suggestions made by China, uh, earlier explained by Senior Colonel Zhou as well? I think they're good proposals. Uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them as just being purely abstract. I think there's a fair amount of detail in them, but there are limits to how detailed it can be at this stage. And considering that none of the parties are on the verge of wanting uh, wanting peace of their own accord at this point in time, I will make one point, and that's an important point to make. You know, after the end of the Cold War, the West's view with Russia was that, hey, Russia, you need to get the imperial gene out of your system and the Cold War, and you need to be done with the Cold War, and, and you need to integrate with Europe and do the and within and stay within your borders. Mm. But for the West, that Cold War never really ended for them. They kept moving their front lines right until China, until Russia's borders. And this has created that sense of, of insecurity. And while there is no, no reason to condone what Mr. Putin has done in Ukraine, one cannot dismiss this, 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 this this creeping movement forward, which has bred insecurity at Russia's end. And we need to find solutions in a more holistic way because we've seen the Euro European security architecture has crumbled because of 40 million people right now. Mm. And we certainly don't want in Asia because of 23 million people, 4 billion people, the security architecture, right. which, which protects 4 billion people crumbling also. And mm. so we need to take those lessons of what has happened in Ukraine and try to see that they are not ap applied uh, in, in Asia, mm. in the Indo-Pacific. Many of the principles stated in the uh, political settlement uh, policy suggestions by China are the principles that the international community have agreed upon for decades. And yet, recently, we have hardly hear some of those points uh, being repeated loudly by the international community. So, uh, Professor Toker, I think uh, it is also a good time to remind us some of the earlier principles that we all agreed upon. It's a good idea to remind us as often as possible of <laughs> common sense mm. insights and recommendations such as not to use war as a, a, a mean, a tool in international affairs. It's always an excellent idea to recommend uh, uh, preventing any humanitarian damages. Uh, that's, that's excellent. The question right now in terms of what is happening in front of the entire world over the battlefield in Ukraine is whether the Chinese diplomacy and potential Chinese leverages will enter the scene, perhaps behind the scene, not over TV cameras mm. and something that will be able to capture on video images you were talking about a minute ago, but in using its influence behind the curtains in order to put, yes, some pressure both on the Russian and Ukrainian parties right. in order to try and transcode the general principles into concrete 
points which may enable a ceasefire. That would be an extraordinary progress. Right. Senior Colonel Zhou, on the one hand, the international community, as uh, demonstrated by Mr. Gupta and I mean, Professor Toker, they sincerely hope that China will be able to make some progress for all sides to come to some kinds of uh, better political possibilities uh, for the current uh, con uh, crisis. But on the other hand, uh, China did state very clearly this earlier has nothing to do with China, this conflict. Uh, China was not the initiator. China was not supporting any specific side in this regard. But uh, geopolitics is, uh, in a way, uh, interpreting everything in a very different lens. So, Senior Colonel Zhou, how do you see uh, China's role now, you know, uh, sincerely speaking, not uh, rhetorically speaking, what is China's role? And what role does China aspire to play as part of the international community? I think that people may just take China's neutrality as a kind of in inaction. I don't think so. I, I think China has already uh, contributed it, the, uh, uh, greatly to peace in Europe in two senses. First of all, China uh, neutrality basically has uh, prohibited anyone, you know, from uh, throwing wood into the fire. Because you think of uh, China's uh, weight. If China is, stands with Russia, uh, then probably we're already uh, uh, in the uh, Third World War, right? So China uh, has not participated in this war itself is a, a, a kind of a contribution. Secondly, China has made it quite clear that nuclear weapons should not be used. Mm. Nobody knows whether Russia would use nuclear weapons or not, but at least <coughs> can give a lot of hints you know, on different occasions. But uh, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping has stressed on this you know, in his talks with uh, German Chancellor Scholz, in his talks with uh, President Biden at G20. So if Chinese President is talking about this, I think this should have been heard by the Russian side. Nobody knows whether these words would really mm. uh, have taken some effect, but I'm sure uh, it would be considered seriously because mm. of uh, uh, because this comes from China. All right. Earlier, we have noticed that China has also published its uh, Global Security Initiative concept paper this Tuesday, in which it said, and here I quote, it will stay committed to peacefully resolving differences and disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation. War and sanctions, according to the paper, are no fundamental solution to disputes. Only dialogue and consultation are effective in resolving differences. This also echoes China's earlier position paper on the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis, calling for resuming peace talks. In the Ukraine crisis, of course, uh, there are a lot of points that needs to be touched on. But uh, uh, Mr. Gupta, uh, your thoughts on this, uh, that some of the principles we should once again uh, raise it up and remind everybody. Yes, you know, on the on the global security initiative, uh, there, were, there, there are two dimensions to this. One is there is a defensive, slightly defensive dimension from on China's side, and one is a very proactive dimension. Let me get to the defensive dimension. This the global security initiative was released at the Boal Forum uh, by President Xi two months after the Ukraine crisis started. It was, in fact, uh, you know. China was initially tagged that this was a no-limits partnership, that it knew something about what was going to happen, which was completely false. And I think China needed to show at that point of time that its view and its practice of international relations is very different from what we are seeing happening in the European theater. Mm -hmm. And the Global Security Initiative was a statement of that. It was a restatement of a lot of Chinese uh, uh, international relations principles with a, with a lot more added depth and detail to it. But here's the proactive dimension. And the proactive dimension is that China does not want international relations to degenerate into a block-based formations. It wants the United Nations centeredness in terms of peace and security to be front and center. And the Global Security Initiative 
is embedded within that UN centeredness and hopes to do away with block politics, power politics, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And from that, that perspective, I think it's a very valuable contribution because while it might sound a little bit abstract, it is what is going to help us to what is going to help the international community not fall into blocks and not get into competition which will degenerate into conflict and mm -hmm. from that perspective i think it was it is an important initiative which needs to be restated and its principles articulated often to all comers mm. professor toker how much danger do you see that some countries might be manipulating the latest crisis furthermore as a way to move all of us toward a division that look like the earlier Cold War? There is a potential danger of this nature, absolutely, uh, on the part of more than one uh, a specific mm. country. Uh, yes, uh, this is what often happens when there is such a, a, a huge scale uh, confrontation uh, over a real battlefield. And this is why also um, everything that could be done in, in any way in order to appease things is welcome. Mm. Uh, I would, if I get slightly away from the uh, Cold War logics and the polarization uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, scheme and all that, I would say objectively that if we look at the two belligerent parties, the Russians and the Ukrainians, both of them are, seem to be convinced right now, at the moment we're speaking, that each one of them has an interest in keep on fighting. The reasons they give for that kind of ambition or aim uh, or policies are, are different, of course, and, 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 and radically uh, uh, of different nature. But both in Moscow and in Kiev, the political power believes that it serves its interests. Now, what Chinese intervention may do, due to general principles, how did you call them? Abstract values, why not? Due to something which will become more detailed, hopefully, I, I, I believe, I hope, uh, um, in terms of concrete uh, conditions, mm. could such an initiative with perhaps some other uh, countries associated to, uh, um, to future steps of the Chinese initiative, could they be decoded and come down to the table to elements which in a way would convince either the Russians or the Ukrainians or preferably both, mm. they do not have such a clear-cut interest in keep on fighting. It's actually enough that one of the two right. would be convinced in that so we can already make some meaningful progress. All right. When China is ready, in other words, uh, Senior Colonel Zhou, uh, to put out a policy paper and suggestions like this, are the two direct parties involved in this uh, crisis ready for something about, uh, uh, too far to say, peaceful settlement, but rather at least some ceasefire, your sense? Well, <clears throat> I think it is uh, possible, but uh, um, you see, the whole thing is not a Chinese issue. No. Uh, when could they come to uh, come down and talk? Probably when both of them are tired and could not uh, continue fighting. Then they are more ready to accept any proposals, and they would compare all these proposals. And they themselves would probably would have some uh, proposals. Mm. You see, right now it's not entirely how this war can be decided by either Russia or by Ukraine. I think I think mostly it has to be decided by Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, so Washington may also have has, has uh, its own proposal, but I just uh, do not see that we out. You see, all the West is supporting Ukraine, so Ukraine can can hardly, you know, uh, come to a stop. But Russia, with all its nuclear weapons in hand, even if these nuclear war, war, war weapons are not used. Uh, Russia cannot uh, be defeated completely, and Russia certainly would not move away. So no war will last forever. Mm. So um, I think eventually there is a peace. But the only question is at what cost and how soon peace can prevail. That is a question, and nobody has an answer. That is the question. On the other hand, the uh, possible peace solutions uh, to a conflict like this, a crisis like this, uh, compared to earlier years, there's a huge difference. One, of course, uh, is uh, the 
geopolitical tensions and competitions that we have seen in different parts of the world, uh, for example, China and the United States. Uh, and then there is also the issue of poly crisis that we are dealing with right now, economy, energy, food, and uh, other crises. Uh, some are related, some are not necessarily directly related to the Russian-Ukraine uh, crisis. So how do you see this web of crises going on all at the same time? What does that mean for our urge and our uh, necessity to help the others to achieve peace? Professor Toker. Well, uh, you're right, although uh, many of the other issues which are uh, the reason for tensions and confrontational approaches of different uh, parties to, uh, to the international scene, mm. even if they're indirectly related or not related at all to the proper war between Russia and Ukraine, are connected to it. So it is a in highly interconnected scene in which even interests which deal with, let's say, Latin America or African stability right. uh, all of a sudden make their appearance in the overall equations which interest us, which is just one more reason why, obviously, if we can uh, uh, um, try and deal with the heart of the conflict, which is now a bloody one, in which two armies and more are confronting each other and people are being killed, it is so um, uh, potentially important in order to ease down on the tensions of all the other interconnected uh, issues. And that should be even more okay. of an incentive to the Chinese and whoever may support them uh, to be creative, very creative, perhaps creative in a way we haven't imagined yet. Let it be done discreetly without, say, the international press and and politicians comment right. on it abundantly, but let it be creative in order to try to put things forward. Well, uh, Mr. Gupta? Uh, I think because of the, the poly crisis will actually be an accelerant to finding some sort of a ceasefire, actually, because the impact is so widespread and, and, and in far away, poor people are being affected by what's happening in Ukraine, energy, food, etc energy, food, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and so I think the poly crisis actually will accelerate a search for solutions or that search for, for, for a ceasefire. But I think one of the important points we also need to bear in mind is that there is a, there is a Russia-Ukraine fight. There is a, a issue in Europe, within the European security architecture. Let's not be adding more complications here in trying to utilize this contest, this, this, this war into a democracies versus autocracies issue and then kind of supersize it in, at, uh, to the to the internet, to the at the level of the international system, mm -hmm. I think let's try to find solutions. Let's try to narrow things down and find solutions rather than making, rather than exacerbating and adding and 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 widening the the nature of the conflict. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm actually hoping that we, we, by by end summer we will really be looking towards the end of what will be right. the armed part of this conflict. Senior Colonel Joe, uh, you have 30 seconds if you can. I think Mr. Gupta made a very good point because this is definitely is not a war between autocracy and democracy. I was in Munich Security, Munich Security Conference, which I believe has drawn precisely the wrong conclusion, putting China and Russia on one side as an autocratic revisionist against the democracy on the other side, uh, so that uh, China and Russia are challenging the international order. The international order is not a liberal international order. It is actually a combination, a hybridation of everything together. People's national identity, social system, religions, uh, so on and so forth. So it's a mixture. It's not uh, just that uh, because the West has basically made the rules and regimes after mm -hmm. the Second World War, therefore, these economic rules and regime would constitute the order. All right. The world order is much bigger than that. Senior it Colonel Joe Bo. Yes. Thank you so much. Senior Colonel Joe Bo, Rab Gupta, and uh, Joe Ab Toker. Thank you so much. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, try to find us uh, on YouTube and also check our uh, Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for being with us.